the year is 1627. This is Plymouth Colony, an English town set up by Reformed church people from Leiden and also tradesmen out of England. These people hope to own land. They are struggling on the edge of a wilderness. They stayed on the Mayflower until they were able to build simple shelters. The simplest house in the town is Howland House, and that is built with uh, a cratchet-framed structure. You find forks in the woods, natural uh, forks and trees, and you use that as support, support uh, posts. Uh, it's very simple, very, very simple. Children can do it with the utmost ease. So up at the ridge line, up there, there's a fork, and we call it a cratchit. So the whole structure is held together with the fork, natural fork in the tree. The roof joists all meet that ridge line. They're all just small saplings in the green. The bark is still on them. They're less than six inches in diameter. You just go out into the forest and you cut it down and you put it right up. It's very, very easy and it's a very quick way to get yourself out of the winter, out of the rain, out of the summer heat. This is a place where people are coming from middle class backgrounds and they're taking a much more impoverished lifestyle than they're used to. You have some, some kettles, brass kettles, and when you have a rare dose like this, you're cooking on a tripod. This is called a rare dose and it's just large field stone that has been strategically built to create an armchair to contain the fire, it contains the heat acts as a thermal mass, which can warm the house because the stones absorb that heat. This is the simplest house. You could find something like this in England, but it would be a beast house for cattle. It'd be a hay barn. It'd be a tool shed. It'd be like today living in your garage. In England, a lot of homes would have this wattle and daub construction, wattle being the vertical or horizontal sticks, and the daw being a clay mixture that packs it in, acts as insulation. This here is daub, and the sticks here are, are known as wattle. This is called lath, oak lath. It's a horizontal, thin piece of wood that stretches across. The wattle is just hardwood sticks of a thin diameter that have been found, just brush that gets cleared. The daub is clay, earth, silt, sand. It's a mixture that changes from place to place. There's no formula. And it's applied very easily. Children can do it. Just get a little bit of water on it. Not very much. Now try it. That might work more better. How's that? There. Now smooth it on out. Make it look pretty. There are ways to make daub look very fine and very fair. And this is a method that is still done in many, many places in the world, like in West Africa and in India, South America. Wattle and daub is a common construction. Really serves as a good insulator. When this is finished, some of these panels can be as thick as three inches or six inches thick. And that's a massive amount, similar to modern drywall and plaster. Most of these resources can be found on your land. Clay, the vast majority of the United States has clay soil. All that's needed is small diameter sticks, some kind of lath material, and sand and dirt, and clay. Very simple. And in England, you use a lime wash, that distinctive white color when people think of English homes. And the lime wash is what protects the daub from rain so it doesn't melt. They don't have that here. They don't have any lime, no mortar, no lime wash, and no one who makes it either. So instead, they rive, they rive clabberds. The way that these are made is using a bolt, a big log that has been split you take a fro, a horizontally bladed tool, you strike a mallet with it, and you literally cleave the wood fibers apart. It works in the same way that celery works when you tear the little fibers apart. It's the same concept, except on a massive scale. 
So if you think of a collaborate, it's really just a small fiber of celery. So you have this oak board. It literally just gets tagged up and nailed in, and they all lap on top of each other so that the water runs down over them instead of under them. In the same way that shingles work on roofs. And this is how Viking ships are made. This is the beginning of a vernacular architecture that is previous to them, fairly unknown, especially because wood is very expensive in England. So they come to this place and it's a free-for-all for a commodity that is scarce to them. And like a lot of human populations, when confronted with something you've always thought of as scarce, you overconsume, you overindulge. The roof is made from thatch. In England, thatch is a country solution to roofing. In the cities, thatch isn't used, it's banned. Because of the danger of fire, in cities they use tile. But in the country, they use a water reed thatch or they use uh, wheat straw from fields. See these, uh, the roof here. And the way that it's sewn together, so you can see the horizontal lath along the roof joist. See that fiber wrapped around? That is what ties those bundles together. So they're literally woven through with a giant needle. Usually you work in tandem. One person on the roof, one person on the inside. So the person on the roof passes the needle through, the person inside catches it and removes the line and sets it up for the next course. And you work your way all along. It's literally sewn within the rafters, the joists. It's like a giant quilt made of grass. This is hundreds of bundles of thatch, which makes a watertight roof that essentially acts as a massive sponge. It absorbs water and it laps it off. So the water drips from the ends of the reeds, but it doesn't drip downwards through the roof. If thatch is maintained, it can last as long as, there are thatch roofs in England that are over 700 years old. If it's maintained, if the crown of the roof is, is replaced every few years, the whole structure can, can be ancient. It's a very clever way to build this sort of grid pattern is very simple, very crude. It doesn't take an enormous amount of skill. And in fact, if you were to do it in the modern world, wheat straw and most marsh reed, uh, you could use invasives like Phragmites and clean up ecosystems, or you can use the agricultural byproduct of, of wheat production that is just gonna be wasted anyways. Use the wheat straw. This house represents a, a fairly good picture of a middling life that is fairly comfortable at this point. It has hewn beams and timbers. So you can see, instead of cratchits like in the old house that I showed, the first house, instead of the forks, these are actually joined together using mortise and tenon. Tongue and groove, it's like Lincoln logs. This whole place is built that way in a very simple form of timber framing because they're trying to get these houses up fast, efficiently, get out of the weather. But also, they're aware that they may not be here in seven years. They may leave. So they aren't necessarily building their dream home forever. They're not quite up to the point of using wooden floors. It's not a thing yet partially because sawing is not yet an industrial thing here. The forge is this way. This is called the early modern period, the early 17th century. This is the, the village forge. In this period, what we know of as consumer culture, receiving a, a daily wage, going to the store, buying everything you need, is something that is still gaining traction. It's not quite established. This place represents the first forge of Plymouth Colony. It's much more economical for them to produce things here than it is to import it from England. This place is a little strange because we are rebuilding our chimney. You can see the big, the great bellows connected through the tweer. It is pumped up with this lever and the air feeds the forge fire making the fire much hotter than it would be otherwise, hot enough to forge iron and steel. 
but one person can do this by themselves. See, you can tend the fire at the same time. And so the fire is done. You bring the iron red hot to the anvil and you forge it. And while you're doing that, the rest of what you're working on, the temperature will get ready. They don't know temperature. Science is just beginning to explain phenomena in their world. So they know color, they know feel and texture. They know that a white hot iron means welding heat and that you can join iron and steel together at that heat. But they don't know that the molecules literally join or that there are molecules. So these are some of the hammers that we use. This is the primary forging hammer almost identical to modern blacksmithing tools. I have hinges that I've made, yeah. gate hooks, a staple. I'm a full-time professional blacksmith. My attraction to this craft is that it is the most difficult craft that I have ever put my hand so, to. This is what's needed for one garden gate. That's a grindstone. It's fitted with a handle. Two people have to be involved. So one person spins while the other person sharpens a blade, a knife or an ax or a sword. And in the bottom tray, in the trough, you would put water. The water keeps the stone from being completely eroded by the blade. It smooths the surface and lubricates it. And it also prevents the blade from losing its temper by keeping the temperature down. So one person spins, probably a child. That's another thing, child labor is a thing in this time. Children work, they don't go to school and they don't play, they go to work. My whole life revolves around this stuff, but that does not equate that I want to go back in time and, and be an English blacksmith. I think it'd be dreadful. I don't consider myself a Luddite because if you do the research, the hard research into this period, it is not a pleasant time to live. These trades are brutal. The, the world of labor is a brutal world. It is not a time of bucolic, natural wonder and appreciation. It's a very hellish time from a modern American perspective. They say that a carpenter can only work for 10 to 15 years professionally before his body is broken and he can't work any longer. These people are done at age 30, 35. They're done. So it may seem tedious, it is. And that's because iron nails bend very easily. If they're not driven uh, perfectly, they will, they will bend. So something that I have to do occasionally is to straighten some for carpenters usually. Everything is done by yourself in this period and that means everything. I have a lot of respect for DIY culture and the idea of becoming less dependent on extractive or oppressive systems but you don't want to go full 17th century because then you will also be farming, fishing, and hunting all the time. And producing what you need. Now, most of these people don't know how to produce things on their own. So you would think, well, why don't they just make it? These are people who come from a place where you buy a lot of things and so they will just go without a lot of the time. You don't have the knowledge base to do it yourself so you just go without. It's an American idea I think to solve problems all the time or to even want to solve problems. So I'm not nostalgic, but what I am is someone who appreciates the past. And I appreciate my forebears. And as a modern blacksmith, you have to appreciate your roots to know who you are and where you're going. Not, um, 
I'm a little bit different because people assume that you're a, a reenactor because you, you want to live in the time. And, and some of us are, but I know if I were to go back in time, I wouldn't do well. I'd probably, uh, I wouldn't live very long, I don't think.